My name is Jeff Nix, and I'm an associate professor of urology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm one of the urologic oncologists in our division, and today we're going to be talking about MRI, imaging for prostate cancer, and the utilization of targeted MRI fusion biopsies. So uh, the specific topic we're going to talk about now is, is patients who are undergoing active surveillance for prostate cancer. And essentially, what active surveillance for prostate cancer is a little different than other cancers in that there are a large subset of patients that may not need treatment, may not benefit from treatment for prostate cancer. And so we have to really safely determine who those patients are. Um, and there's a lot of patients who worry about losing the opportunity for cure. Um, so what is active surveillance? For basically, it's a careful selection of men who are at low risk of harm from prostate cancer that don't need treatment. We're going to monitor these men over the course of, of years to, to select those patients who might have any evidence of progression of their disease. And for those who do, we would then intervene so that we could still provide them with curative treatment. Um, so essentially, we're trying to minimize the side effects of unnecessary treatment and trying to determine who those patients are. There's a lot of harm from prostate cancer treatment and screening for those patients that don't require it. There's unnecessary testing, there's overdiagnosis, and again, overtreatment. And so if you look at the incidence rates among men in, in the United States after the advent of PSA screening, the incidence of prostate cancer went way up. And the reality is a large percentage of those cases do not require treatment and would not have affected those men's either quantity or quality of life. And so the, the, what we're trying to determine is how can we best identify who those patients are. And so essentially we have to come up with approaches to reduce overtreatment of prostate cancer. And how we do that is we look for new biomarkers that can assess uh, the disease severity, can reduce unnecessary biopsies, reduce screening in older men who don't require treatment, as well as, as perform active surveillance for low-risk men, which is what we're talking about here. So how do we determine active surveillance for prostate cancer? And, and, and the main ways we do this is through clinical stage of patients, which is through examination, a blood test called a PSA, as well as biopsy parameters. And those biopsy parameters that are important are grade and volume for the most part. And we look at lots of different centers where active surveillance is performed. And there are different criteria slightly, but for the most part, we're looking for patients with low grade disease who have a low volume of disease and a PSA level that's less than 10. And these are simply surrogates for disease severity. We're trying to determine those patients who don't have clinically significant disease. And these are different ways that we can do that or historically have done that. And then we have to follow these patients. So if we assess a patient and we think based on those parameters that they can undergo active surveillance, in other words, their disease does not need to be treated, how do we follow them? And the way we do that now in most programs in North America is an exam, a rectal exam, as well as a blood test every six to 12 months, and then periodic rebiopsies. And those rebiopsies can range from every 18 months to, in some programs, yearly. And those biopsies, you know, for men are significant. There's a, an invasive nature to these biopsies as well as an infection risk. So what are, the, what are the problems with that system? And the reality is the main problems are in inaccuracy and staging. So those patients who are initially defined as having low-risk disease, do they really have low-risk disease? And the biopsy method is the main issue uh, in this system. And the reality is the way we've done the biopsy for prostate cancer hasn't changed much over the last 30 or 40 years. And the reality is we take random samples of the prostate. And so we'll take six cores from the left side in different segments of the prostate and six cores from the right side in different segments of the prostate. And that's the way we diagnose prostate cancer and the way we determine the grade and the stage based on volume. And this has not changed significantly in a long period of time. And so you look at estimates for the ability for that biopsy to predict the actual volume of disease at final pathology for patients who undergo surgery for prostate cancer. And the reality is it's not very good, around 50%. And so the other thing we discussed earlier is there is an associated infection risk as well. And so each time these patients get a biopsy, there's around a 1% to 2% risk of a significant infection that can cause patients to get admitted to the ICU or require minimum antibiotics for treatment. And there's some concerns for over time risk of uh, significant sequelae of multiple repeated biopsies causing trauma to patients' nerves as well as uh, increasing the risk for infection.
We also look at, you know, how do we confirm a patient's initial staging is accurate? And, and one of the main ways this is done, again, is through a repeat confirmatory invasive biopsy. And if you look at uh, some data from Memorial Sloan Kettering about initial confirmatory biopsy within the first year, the reality is that predicted pretty well patients that would then go on to progress out of active surveillance, but 60% of those patients had a negative biopsy. In other words, those patients didn't need that biopsy. They had an unnecessary biopsy uh, is one way to think of it. And so we have to come up with a better way to assess disease without uh, requiring patients to undergo just a random biopsy uh, without any targeting whatsoever. And one of the ways we can do that is through the technology that we're going to describe. And how do we how do we decide who we intervene on is another problem we have. And so a patient's undergoing active surveillance, we have different triggers to determine whether or not their disease is worse. And those triggers can be the PSA blood test, uh, a re on the repeat biopsies, does it look like they have more volume of disease? Do we see a higher grade of disease? And those are very imprecise ways that we're trying to get a metric of their volume of disease or their disease severity. And when we're looking at Volume, we're looking at things like percentage of core that's positive. So we'll take these core uh, needle biopsies of this uh, of the prostate gland and how much of that percentage of that core is positive is one of the ways we assess volume. Another way is how many cores are positive. And again, these are just random samplings through the gland. And so whether or not we happen to hit the index tumor in that patient's gland will determine how we assess their volume. And so you may get a biopsy on a patient, get a repeat biopsy a month later, and their volume is completely different based on that random sampling. And so these are major inaccuracies in this system. Other reasons patients fall out of active surveillance are psychosocial. So because they also understand this is a random sampling, they're concerned as well. The patient is that, hey, is this really what I have? Is this really my true disease burden? And we see a lot of patients who fall out of active surveillance for those reasons as well. And so when we look at large centers um, and multiple studies looking at active surveillance, one of the two main triggers for that intervention is PSA doubling time. So that lab test has increased over time and that's used as a trigger to intervene in those patients because it's a surrogate for disease severity. But the reality is that we know that in men as they age that PSA will increase and so it's a little bit of a false leader. The other thing is, is grade progression. So around 30% of patients over five years can fall out of disease because of grade progression. Um, and this has ranged from 15 to 30% in other large series. And so again, what we talked about earlier is, is that truly a grade progression? Or because of the random sampling, was it inaccurate staging initially for those patients? And so through the utilization of multi-parametric MRI, and so we're getting these MRI images of a patient's prostate, looking at it over different sequences, both anatomical and functional. Um, one of the ways we can better assess this is through multi-parametric MRI imaging of the prostate. And so uh, a paper we published, uh, Dr. Rasparami and I were on while we were at the National Cancer Institute, looking at the accuracy of this imaging modality in selecting men for active surveillance. And the basic premise here is we can get an image-defined identity for that prostate cancer. We can see the index tumor. We can see the volume of that tumor. And then we can accurately biopsy those patients by targeting that actual lesion, in which we'll talk about a little bit in a separate section. But in this study, we looked at around 100 patients classified as active surveillance patients. So they came in, referred to us at the National Cancer Institute as patients who were active surveillance candidates. We performed the MRI of their prostate, we performed the targeted biopsy for those index lesions, and around 30% of those men, so one in three of those men were reclassified as actually having disease that was worse and that did not qualify for active surveillance. And so this helps again to define what we're talking about is that are we seeing grade progression in these 15 to 30% of men who fall out of active surveillance over the first five years, or is it a truly, mis is it truly a misunderstanding of their initial disease burden? And we think that that's a big part of it. And this study is helping us to see that. We also see other uh, centers that have shown similar things. Uh, in that study, we also looked at a nomogram to help, to help predict patients who would fall out. And we looked at things such as the MRI identified index lesion, the number of lesions seen on MRI. And again, these are uh, surrogates we're using for volume of disease. But if you think about how much better of a surrogate for volume this is, 
than random samplings and a percentage of a core on a random sampling, we can actually see these index tumors and identify them based on 3D volumetric assessments. So this is, uh, these were both very predictive for the patient's ability to stay in or out of prostate, uh, active surveillance for prostate cancer. And, and that included um, typical standard surrogates for disease like the PSA, the clinical stage as well. So we also see this in other studies have looked at the same thing. This has been reproduced. This is not just our center that has seen this. Uh, a study out of Hopkins looking at patients who are already on active surveillance looking at their MRI of their prostates and, and being able to assess whether or not those patients would then fall out of active surveillance based on the MRI assessment. And what we found in, and what they found in that study was that men who had a negative MRI were very unlikely to fall out of active surveillance compared to men who had a positive MRI. And again, what we're trying to drive at here is in a system going forward in the future where we can pre prevent patients from having to have yearly biopsies of their prostate, um, and, and as invasive as that is, how can we better predict their disease without having to require unnecessary biopsies? And these are studies that are alluding to that evidence. Uh, another study, a multi-institutional study, looking at patients who had been on active surveillance for years, looking then at their MRI of their prostate and then a directed targeted fusion biopsy, which is using the same technology that we're using here at UAB, to determine those patients who truly had clinically significant disease. And what we're trying to define by clinically significant disease is that disease that has a, has a significant impact on a patient's life, if, if left untreated, would cause patients harm both in quality and quantity of life. And the MRI ultrasound targeted biopsies were much more predictive of overall disease burden, were much more likely to diagnose the truly clinically significant disease with fewer biopsy cores. And again, the more cores you add to a, a patient's biopsy, there is a risk over a certain limit of an increase in infection risk as well. And so just to give an example of um, this technology used here at UAB, um, we had a recent patient, uh, Dr. Resparami and I treated, who was a 47-year-old man who came in with a new diagnosis of very low-risk prostate cancer. So these are patients that the National Comprehensive Cancer Network identifies as those patients who will not benefit from treatment based on how insignificant their disease burden is. He had one core on a random sampling of Gleason 6 disease and less than 5% of that core. Again, the two surrogates, as we've talked about, that we're using for volume there is the percentage of the core and the number of cores. And as well as grade, identify this patient with a PSA of 5 as having very low risk disease. He came to us as a second opinion. Uh, we performed an MRI of his prostate using multiple parametric MRI, again, looking at both anatomic and functional sequences. This patient had a very large index tumor confined to the prostate, but in a atypical location. And this is something that we see a lot as patients get referred into us, is the, the typical geography of where we're looking for this disease is in the bottom half of the prostate. But in a lot of patients, and there's some theories in African-American patients specifically, that there may be a different geographic distribution. Their disease may be more located in different parts of the prostate that we're not sampling in a standard random biopsy. This patient fell into that category, had a large anterior lesion. We biopsied it. He was found to have very high-risk prostate cancer in that dominant nodule. He went on a treatment with us here at UAB uh, and has, uh, so far, no evidence of recurrence, is clinically cured from his prostate cancer. But again, this is a patient that would have been referred and would have been placed on an active surveillance regimen and simply because of inaccurate staging. And this is how we feel like this technology can benefit our patients here at UAB.